Early this morning, I, uh, I got a text uh, from my sister that she had sent uh, uh, to me, my our other brother and sister, and sent to all the siblings there, and it was just awesome on an early Mother's Day, uh, just uh, reminding us uh, about our mom. I could almost hear my mom's voice in that little text that she sent us, and what she sent us was called Moms Now versus Moms Then. And uh, it just, as, as I was reading through it, I could just hear my mom's voice in all of these. For example, this is mom's now. That word is inappropriate. Mom's then, say that again, I'll wash your mouth out with soap. <laughs> and that was one of my mom's favorites. She took it up a notch. We uh, got Tabasco sauce when we really let something fly. And, uh, and I know it was abuse. I just didn't know it was abuse then. And um, or moms now, hey, good job, good job trying one bite of dinner I made. Now you can have the mac and cheese. Moms then, you'll eat what I make whether you like it or not. There are children starving in the world. <laughs> or moms now, I can see you're upset. Take a deep breath and use your words. Moms then, you better stop crying or I'll really give you something to cry about. Or moms now, you, you can't walk around the block by yourself. I'll drive you. Then text me when you need a ride back. Moms, you want to go out? Take your bike and be home before dark. Or moms now, I packed your bento box with almond butter on whole grain kale chips and an organic smoothie. Moms then, take a brown bag with a bologna sandwich on Wonder Bread, white Wonder Bread, the best bread ever made, Wonder Bread. Grab a Twinkie. And a why and punch. Well, you know, parenting has changed uh, and things are different. I wouldn't say one is necessarily better than another. But I know one thing that has not changed from generation to generation of parenting and particularly being a mom. Now, then, always. Being a mom is difficult, challenging, hard and sometimes thankless work. And it's always been difficult to be a mom. It can be the source of the greatest joy in life, and it can also bring some of the greatest pain in your life. And so we're in a series that we just kicked off a couple of Sundays ago called Always Near. It's based on this book by our friend Robert Morgan. Robert was here with us a couple of Sundays ago to, to kick off the launch of his uh, new book. And we've got these out uh, still for sale, still available in the lobby one more Sunday. And uh, these will be an excellent Mother's Day gift if you kind of need something quick. And uh, you can stop by there and pick one up. And uh, some of Rob's other books are there. I hope you'll get one. And... Uh, and so we're just looking at this, this foundational truth, and this is it, that God wants a relationship with you, and he's done everything to make that relationship possible. So that's the truth that we work from. That's really the message through the Bible. God is pursuing you. He desperately wants a relationship with you, and he's done everything to make it possible. That's the message of the Bible. God wants to be near to us. Psalm 1611, sort of the theme verse. I love this verse. It says, God, you make known to me the path of life. God, you make known the path of life to me. You fill me with joy in your presence. And that's what we talk about fun. That's what we talk about celebration. Joy in God's presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And so we're in the presence of God, filled with joy and pleasure. And so our goal is, over these few weeks, leading right up into June, is that you can experience, maybe as you've never experienced before, or at deeper levels than you've ever experienced it before, God's presence and the nearness of God. And so let me remind you of this relationship truth right here. In every relationship, you are either drawing nearer, or you're drifting away, drifting apart. You're drawing near or drifting apart away in every relationship. And so it's in every relationship we have in life. It's true in our spiritual relationship with God. And so relationships are not static. Our spiritual relationship is dynamic. It's always changing. It's never static. And so as we either draw near to God, we enjoy His presence, benefit from His presence, or we're drawing are drifting apart from God, if you've drifted apart from God, 
we want you to, to start drawing closer to him. And so last week, we talked about how important communication is to any relationship. And of course, in our relationship with God, it's vitally important. And so we looked, first of all, how we can listen to God. Communication, key to a relationship, part of that is listening. And how do we listen to God, and how does God speak to us? So we looked at four ways that God speaks to us. He speaks to us, first of all, and primarily through His Word. We call that the Bible. He's given us His written Word. Then he speaks to us through other believers, preachers, teachers, other believers God will use to give voice to his word and he'll speak to us. He'll speak to us through his Holy Spirit that gives us impressions. Taking his word and we test these against God's word, but God can speak to us in our spirit with his Holy Spirit. And then the fourth way that God will speak to us is through our pain. Through the suffering, the hurt, part of the purpose of pain in life is that God is able to get our attention and to speak to us. Now, the flip side of that communication is not just listening to God, but it's also speaking to God. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, is how do we speak to God? And we call that prayer. A.W. Tozer said this about prayer. The chief purpose of prayer is to realize the presence of your heavenly Father. Now, you think about that. The chief purpose of prayer is to realize that God is near to us, to realize the presence of our Heavenly Father. And God is near to us when we pray. Right there at the top of your outline, if you have your worship bulletin this morning, the back of that, and God may speak to you through His Word this morning. So some of you may just have begun the habit of just jotting down what God speaks to you on a Sunday morning as you're here. Someone reminded me, they liked it when I told them, well, you're here anyway. Why don't you just go ahead and make the most of it? And one way you do that is by listening to God speak to you, take notes and wallow along in your Bible. And, uh, and so in, first, uh, in Psalm 145, 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him. Look at it, he's, he's here. All who speak to Him, call to Him, pray to Him, He is near. To all who call on Him in truth. And so we listen to His Word. God loves to hear His Word prayed back and spoken to him and he is near so right there at the top of your outline and this is how you can think about prayer prayer is connecting with God you know you've probably been around somebody maybe you just met them for the very first time but you felt a connection you know there's something there well this is how we can know and feel a connection with God it's through prayer now what I want to do in just sort of an introductory way is to give you a few facts and truths about prayer. Then I'm going to take you and show you an illustration of prayer in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 1. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible app, you can look to 1 Samuel 1. It's a great story. My guess is there's a fairly good number of people here who may have never heard this story before. And it's a great Mother's Day story. 1 Samuel 1. So here are the couple of prayer facts. You probably know this if you haven't even consciously thought about it. The first one is that prayer is hard. Prayer is difficult. And you you think, well, why would prayer be so difficult? I thought, why is this so hard? And I got thinking about it. Well, sometimes it's just hard to, to, to talk to people that we may have a relationship with, even those that are closest to us. And Sometimes I find it's hard to, to talk to Donnell. Usually when I've done something I know that, that she didn't like and didn't want me to do or, or I, I just was, you know, or, or whatever. It, you know, prayer is hard. Prayer is difficult. And that's true in our relationship with God amped up a little bit because we have an enemy who's doing everything he can to keep us from talking to him. And so there's a usurper in there. So prayer is hard. So if you think that prayer is hard and difficult, let me tell you, it is. It is for everybody. Secondly, Prayer really works. It does make a difference. It is powerful. It is effective. It changes things. That's why the devil throws everything at you to keep you from praying. We were created. We were designed. We were made to talk to God. We were made to pray. But we're not good at it. And when we're not good at something, we get frustrated. And we just quit sometimes. Now, sometimes our frustrations are caused by these misconceptions we have about prayer. 
Let me just show you, like for example, sometimes we think about prayer in these terms. Like we would never maybe say it, but we think about prayer sort of this magic wand that we just sort of say some magic words, some magic prayers, and it's sort of mystical and magical, and it can change things. Or we think about prayer as, a, as calling 911 or it's a fire extinguisher and that we only pray in case of emergency and, and we call out to God in those times we need him to do something for us. Or prayer to us seems like this tug of war that we're sort of bargaining with God. Well, God, if, if you'll do this, I'll do that. And if I'll do that, I expect you to do this. And we sort of look at it that way. Or in some sense, we think about prayer as being a ritual. But really, prayer is a conversation. It's not a ceremony. And that's what we need to understand. This is just simply a conversation with someone. And this particular someone loves us more than we can imagine. And, and, the, and as we pray, it can just be a relationship, not a ritual. It's a conversation, not a ceremony. And, and, and let me just give you these four facts about prayer real quickly. Just jot them down there in your bulletin somewhere. One is that God loves for you to talk to him. He really does love to hear from you and have you talk to him. Number two, God listens to prayers that are simple and sincere. There's not a magic formula. There's really no way that you could say something wrong. Just, it's, it's just honest, sincere, authentic conversation, simple and sincere. You should pray just like you talk. Three, God likes to show his grace by answering prayer. You know, I, I don't know what gives God maybe the greatest joy and the great pleasure, but I know right on the list of those things that, that God would say are fun and is a blast is answering prayer. And I think he just loves to show his grace by answering prayer. And the fourth thing is that God longs to be close to you. He, he longs in that communication to draw close to you as he speaks to you and you speak to him. Look at these two verses on your outline. Isaiah 30, 18 says, So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. There might be somebody here this morning that just needed to hear that one word and that God's just waiting for you to come to him because he's got his love and compassion being ready to pour it out in his answer of grace to you if you come to him this morning. Or look at James 4, 8. Come close to God, and he'll come close to you. God says, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. And so that's what God is looking for. Let me illustrate this one. Here's a story probably most of us are familiar with. It's the story of Jonah in the belly of the whale. And you know what happens? Jonah runs when God calls him to go to Nineveh. He wants, doesn't want to do that. He goes the other way. He gets on a ship. The storm comes up, and they finally figure out Jonah's the cause of all the problems. They throw Jonah overboard in chapter 1. In chapter 1, he's swallowed up by a whale. In chapter 2, we find that, that Jonah now is, and, and he is just in the biggest mess, the biggest trouble he could be in. And in Jonah 2.2, 2, it says, In my distress, I called to the Lord. He answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. Jonah turned his panic into prayer. And that's what he did right there in, in the midst of the belly of the whale. And, 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 and Rob Morgan talks about that little story of Jonah in the belly of the whale here in his book, Always Near. And let me just share, he says, The longer Jonah prayed, the better he felt. And the sicker the fish became. Finally, spitting him onto dry ground, vomited Jonah out on dry ground. And that's what prayer does. It thrills the Lord, nauseates the devil, and frees us. That's what prayer does. It just thrills the Lord, makes the devil sick, and it sets us free. That's what prayer does. It goes on to say, our problems simply cannot imprison us when we pray. And that's what our problems tend to feel like, that we are in prison in these problems with no way out. So Rob says, without prayer, we're trapped by the troubles of life. When we pray, God turns those troubles into tools for accomplishing his will. 
And listen, prayer invites God into our space. And when God comes in, he takes over. And there may be something in your life, a problem in your life, a struggle in your life, a hurt in your life that feels like pain in a prison. And God says, invite me in. I'll take over. So if you have your Bible over in the Old Testament to the book of 1 Samuel, it's a story about speaking to God, but it's a, it's a woman, it's a, a mom who's praying to God. And so here we find a praying mother. And what we learned they really that from, from this story of, of, uh, of Hannah is that praying should be our first response, not our last resort. Now, what we find when we open up the pages of the scripture and come to the story in, in 1 Samuel, that we find that there's this family. It opens up with a, a man by the name of Elkanah. Now, Elkanah had two wives. You can read in verse 2. He had two wives. And, and in polygamy, you'll find, let me say, polygamy you'll find in the Old Testament. And examples of polygamy are not God's endorsement of it. God never finds a polygamy to be acceptable. He tolerated this practice uh, of the people early on, but he never endorses it. It always brings problems. So he had two wives. So Elkanah had two wives, and one was called Hannah, and the other was called Penina. And Penina had children, and Hannah did not. And that began to be a source of conflict in this relationship. And um, Penina had, uh, she had some children. We don't know how many, but she had more than one. And if you just read it in verse 5, for example, in verse 2, it said, oh, Penina had children and Hannah had none. And that sets the story. That sets the context. So every year, Elkanah took his family, his two wives and, and the children by Penina, and they went to a place called Shiloh, to worship God. It'd be like an annual festival and trip that was taking place. So whenever they would go to every year to this place to worship called Shiloh, that when they came time for the sacrifice, Elkanah would make the sacrifice. And he would give portions of the sacrificial meat to his wives. He says to, in verse 4, to Penina and to all her sons and daughter he gave meat. Verse 5. But to Hannah... He gave a double portion. He gave, he gave her twice as much, even though there weren't any mouths to really to feed. The reason he did that, it tells us in verse 5, is that, first of all, he loved her. He loved her. And the second, the Lord had closed her womb. And so now we see that that. Elkanah had, had compassion, he had pity, he could see what was happening and the distress it was causing Hannah. She had no children, and, and so he, he does what men do. I'll just give her some more money, and that will just make it better. And, and it didn't make it better. He, he favored her, and that probably, no doubt, was a little bit of source of conflict within this uh, uh, you know, uh, family dynamic that was taking place. And, and, I, and so in verse 7, it says, year after year, they went there and did this. And Hannah would go up to the house of the Lord. And in verse 7, it says, her rival. And so you tell this relationship between these two ladies is not good. Said her, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Now, that's got to be a pleasant experience for the whole Elkanah and the whole family there. You know, and he's, he's just scratching his head not. Verse 8 is one of my favorite parts of the story because this is where a guy can really kind of tune in right here. So what would I do? Well, this is what in verse 8 Elkanah does. In verse 8, he says to her, well, her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? I just hear myself, Donnell, what's wrong? What's wrong? He just asked, like, you know, any... Red-blooded male does. Baby, what's wrong? Why aren't you eating? Why are you crying? What's the problem? Why are you so downhearted? I love this one. Don't I mean more to you than, than ten sons? 
baby, you're so lucky to have me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, wait, wait, this is, this is awesome. I mean, I, 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 you've got me. You don't need kids. You don't need ten sons. Now, here's a little relationship advice free. If I could have coached Elkanah up, which it's really, I'm so good at it, it had been better off to say, hey, Hannah, you mean more to me than ten sons could ever mean to me. That didn't come natural for him, so he didn't say, he said, what comes natural? Most of the guys, you're lucky to have me. And that's what happened. But you get down to, to verse 10. And so there they are, and, and it says in verse 10, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Now what does she do? She is distraught. She is weeping. She is crying out. What you have here, and I want you to see this. You have a devout, God-fearing, God-believing, we would say church-going family that has problems. And many people find that that, that's just incongruous to them. How can, how can you have problems when, you, when you, you go to church? And so we try to cover up our problems when we come to church, but, but that Elkanah is a little uptight because they're going to church and they can see that things aren't all right at his house. He might be just a little bit uptight and embarrassed by his wife. He said, you, you know, you ought to just keep that at home. But I don't want the folks down there at the church know that we've got problems. But what Hannah does is she prays. And here you find, I think, one of the greatest prayers in all the Bible. Four things I want to show you about a mom who talks to God. And here's the first one. God graciously permits, allows, even gives us problems. God graciously allows us to have problems. You know what it said in verse 5 and 6? The Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, emphasized twice that the Lord's hand is, is right in the middle of this problem. He's allowing it, permitting it, might be causing it to happen. Her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And so it's a source of conflict. Now, she had no children. And yes, I'd understand here, in, in, in ancient times, these times, that for a woman, that really her primary purpose and goal in life was to have children, particularly to have sons. Not to have children was then a sign of disgrace and you, the feeling of immense shame. Children, and specifically sons, were a sign of hope. And there was a future then that was for another generation to come. And so the real value a woman found was having particularly sons. Now what happens when we have problems in life, and we struggle through these things that don't seem like we should really be struggling with and God seems unfair, that when these problems in life, God seems so far away. Why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't he change this? Why doesn't he give me something? Why doesn't he allow something? But God in the problems of life can seem so distant and almost it, it seems like our problems can drive us away from God rather than seeing them as an opportunity to seek him in a deeper way. Can I just show you something right here? You have two women. Penina has children. God's not even on her mind. She's not seeking God, looking for God. She's got this trip down to take a little vacation down to Shiloh to worship. But this is a chance to get out of town. She's not seeking God. But you find Hannah desperately seeking God. And the reason is because of her problems. Blessings never really are a cause for us to, to go seek a deeper relationship with God. That's why God will, in his grace, allow us to experience problems and sufferings in life. Number two, that we should always pray about our problems. It should be our first response, not our last resort. We believe in prayer, but we don't always find prayer to be a natural response to our problems. And so as we read in verse 10, it, it, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. This is a prayer of great pain that is coming 
out from her heart. And then verse 11, and she made a vow. Now she's praying, she vows to God, says, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me. And not forget your servant, but you'll give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now, I know that sounds strange, but what she's doing there is, Lord, if you give me a son, I will give that son to you as a Nazarite vow. We read in number six, Nazarite vow, part of it was you never cut your hair. It was a sign of commitment. It's almost as if she's saying that, God, if you give me a son, I'm going to give him to you to be a missionary a preacher committed to your service. He's my son you give me, but he's really your son I'm giving back to you. And out of her brokenness, Hannah prays this deep prayer and and, 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 and now gives him to God. Now what happens next is quite interesting. And if you're just following along, I, I, I would tell you, now she's just praying. And I think that she doesn't even know what she's doing, but she's praying and as she's praying, Eli, the priest, is over there kind of watching her and probably just from her body language can tell she is upset or something's, you know, is distraught. But what he notices is her mouth is moving. She's moving, mouthing the words, but she's praying silently. The words aren't coming out. She's just... He notices this. Again, just another particular insight on how men kind of pick up on things. Eli knows this is happening here, and immediately she knows, he knows what's going on. She's drunk. She's drunk. So Eli says, goes up to her. Eli thought she was drunk, verse 14. says, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. So verse 15. Oh, no, no, Hannah says. I'm, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I've been pouring out my soul to the Lord. You know, here's, just a little, here's this little free insight. If you turn anywhere else to anything else besides the Lord in the midst of your trouble to some other substance or something to take away your pain, you're just compounding your trouble. And the first thought was, well, she's drunk. And, she, and she's, no, I, I don't, I'm not drinking wine. I'm not drinking beer. I'm not drinking at all. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So she's praying out of that anguish and grief. And so that really speaks to moms, dads, families, children, problems, struggles. Are you praying about those and being drawn closer to God? Now, here's the third thing. We should always pray according to God's will, according to God's purpose. Well, after that happened, Eli said to her, go in peace. The Lord's going to grant you, going to answer your prayers. And, my, and she said, my, your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went away, ate something, and, and her face was no longer downcast. And so what happens there, that, that it changed her countenance. And she prayed, got confirmation of her prayer. And, she, and, and it says in verse 20, So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant. She gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Samuel carries with the meaning of the Lord hears. I asked the Lord for him. The Lord heard me. And, um, and so we pray according to God's prayer. Jesus taught us when we pray, we should always pray according to the will and purpose of God. And um, that's number three. And then and, and, and the, your will be done here. And that's the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer not is to solve our problems so we can live a trouble-free, happy, self-centered life. The purpose of prayer is for God's will to be done and for him to be glorified. And that's what we see happening. So God's purpose was greater than her personal distress. God needed someone that would, in the time of the judges, stand true. That would be Samuel. He brings Samuel in through these, the anguish and the brokenness of Hannah. So Hannah keeps her prayers. Hannah keeps her, her prayer promise. And so what happens is, in verse 20 we, and 21, we begin reading, now... It's time to go again. Well, this time Hannah says, you know, I, I don't want to go. Tells her, I'm not going to go. I want to wait until the child is weaned, which means when he's three or four years old. So she waits three or four years. She goes back to the temple. Eli is there. 
And she comes up to, 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 to Levi and notice what happens now. And, and, and this is number four. We should always praise God for his answers to our prayers. In verse 26, she says, Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy. He has granted my request. And I'm taking this boy. I'm giving him to the Lord. He belongs to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. And here comes this now, this, this praise, this worship to God. And, and don't think this would be easy. Because this is what she was praying for. But yet she gives back to God what God had given her in answer to prayer. You're never closer to God, nearer to God, than when you're totally dependent upon Him. And that's when you worship Him. And that's when you call out to Him in prayer. And, and, and that's really where God gives her grace, pours out the grace upon her. Hannah is the Hebrew word. The Hebrew meaning of the word Hannah, by the way, is grace. God gives her grace. And here I think it's what we can learn on, on a Mother's Day about the nearness of God and speaking to God. Here you find a mother who is hurting. She prayed for God to give her a son. God gave her a son. Sometimes God gives us problems, but those problems are designed to draw us closer to God. So we will always pray according to God's will. And the result of that is we will always praise Him and worship Him. So look what it says in 2 Samuel 1 and 2. It's a great prayer in 2 Samuel 2. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I'll rejoice because you rescued me. No one, no one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Oh, and, and by the way, Hannah had three more sons and two more daughters. You never can outgive God. And whatever you give to God, God will bring back multi -time, multitudes of time back to you. And so you praise Him. You call out to Him. Those are the lessons that we have. So this is what I know this morning. There's moms, but not just moms. There's dads, there's men, there's women, there's boys, there's girls. All of us uh, struggle with pain. That pain may be by God's design to draw us near. Maybe it's pushed you away. But I'd like you to stop for a moment and see how that can draw you nearer to God. And you begin to pray to God to seek out His answers. As you draw near to Him, He'll pour out His grace upon you. He may not answer the prayer the way you want it to answer, but He'll answer it according to His will. As you pray, your will be done. The result will be, as you praise Him and worship Him, you can trust Him. And that's what He wants to do in your life this morning. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come on a Mother's Day Sunday. It reminds us that being a mom is difficult, it's challenging, it brings a lot of great hurt with it. Not just joy, great, some of the greatest joy. But Father, we know that, that even in families, and even in marriages and relationships, Father, that within the home, that the devil comes and attacks. And Father, we know there's a lot of broken hearts that are here today for whatever reason, a lot of hopelessness. And maybe somebody just came in hopeless today and thinking, you're so far away from them they just kind of given up. And I pray that through your word that you just begin to draw them to yourself. They'll draw near to you and reach out to you in a prayer and just say, Father, help me. Help me. And Father, whatever they stand in need of, but they realize you're here to provide it. Thank you for a God who listens to us that we can speak to, that wants to be near us through Jesus Christ, his son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.